I, I would like to thank uh, these amazing speakers. I've, I've learned so much in the last three days, and I am so grateful that you all agreed to come here and share your science. I've been asked to talk about new insights into disease, and connected to that, the behavior of small molecule therapeutics, uh, which may, uh, in this world of condensates, uh, give us some special advantages in thinking about future therapeutic modalities. And to do this, I'm going to focus on three subjects. I'm going to talk to you first about uh, the spectrum of condensate-associated diseases. Turns out I also had to turn on this. Spectrum of condensate-associated diseases. I'll talk to you about a, a case study of a condensate-associated disease, type 2 diabetes. And then finally, I'll talk to you about what we believe are the special chemical environments that uh, biomolecular condensates have. And this first part uh, is work that was uh, led by Salman Banani, Lena Fayan, and Susanna Hawken. And we had uh, an important collaboration here with uh, Ibrahim Cisse and, and others that I'll mention a little later. This work, by the way, was published this morning, so very timely. A way to think about disease is that we all have various phenotypes, and we sit on a spectrum of phenotypic behaviors, and it's at the extreme ends of the spectrum that uh, we call the phenotype disease. A lot of diseases are caused by our own genetics. In fact, it's been estimated that about 76% of us will be afflicted by some genetic disease. And you can segregate them into three classes. They're Mendelian diseases, the rare diseases, like sickle cell, cystic, fibrosis, and Rett syndrome. These are all rare diseases. And I think <laughs> Eric Lander actually defined rare as less than 1%, affecting one, less than 1% of the population. Uh, the cumulative effect of these Mendelian diseases is about 5% of the population at any one time. There are polygenic diseases, diseases where many genes can contribute. They're quite common in the population. Type 2 diabetes is one of them. Heart disease is another big one, Alzheimer's disease. Um, cancer at any one time is affecting somewhere between a half and 5% of the population. About 24% of us will die from cancer. If you look across the models that we have for um, structure function based uh, models of disease, uh, you can make this pie chart that tells you some obvious things. We know of many diseases caused by genetic mutations in catalytic domains or interaction domains. But we're not so sure that these models cover the breadth of known pathogenic mutations. And I'm pretty sure that there are mechanisms that have not yet been recognized that are responsible for a very large fraction. And you know, we've talked about the evolving view of cellular organization in terms of biomolecular condensates. I, I think you know, if you actually look at a movie of some of these smaller condensates and you see them forming and dissolving in kind of 10 second time frames and how frequent they are, it's just really remarkable. And so these static pictures, I think, um, don't represent the really amazing process of the dynamics that we actually see. But I'm using this to point out that there's a diversity of condensates that um, cover actually the vast majority of functional processes in cells that have been studied in great detail from genetic or biochemical points of view. And as you've heard, condensates give you dynamic regulatory capabilities beyond those that we typically envision. Uh, 
in these more conventional interactions of molecular biology. And these, these include, of course, the concentration of components, uh, which can be concentrated uh, to quite some significant degree. They, they include uh, selective compartmentalization, where features of one condensate versus another will concentrate certain molecules and not others. There's metastability in various forms. You've just heard about some of those. And uh, there are interfacial behaviors that you've also heard of. There are some proof of concept studies. Uh, you just heard one. And uh, I'm just citing uh, five other instances in which um, we've seen condensate dysregulation associated with disease mechanism. In Rett syndrome, uh, we think that's a a loss of uh, a nuclear heterochromatic condensates. In Wilms tumor, that appears to be a gain of condensates in chromatin. In uh, Ewing sarcoma, we have condensates forming in the wrong location in the cell. And then we have some of these interesting features of condensates in ALS, a suspicion that there's a liquid to solid transition and in synpolydactyly, uh, a demixing of condensates to cause this uh, phenotype. So what Salman and Lena and Susanna did was they looked at the various kinds of known condensate-promoting features in proteins and uh, classified them according to whether or not they were modular interacting domains. These are small repetitive domains that would give you low affinity, high valency interactions, and include some, some classic, very well-studied domains, uh, an SH2 domain, for example, involved in uh, phosphorylating tyrosine residues on substrates. And as you've heard much about uh, in this meeting, low complexity sequences that include prion-like domains and many others. And what we hypothesized was that when mutated, these sequence features could cause condensate dysregulation in condensate-forming proteins. And what this team did then was to define a set of condensate-forming proteins using curated databases. For example, the Hyman Lab in Dresden uh, curates one of these, and predictive algorithms that would identify the kinds of sequence features I just discussed. And then what they did was they mapped these features onto uh, condensate-forming proteins. And finally, they took the approximately 300,000 likely pathogenic mutations in clinical databases and mapped those onto the condensate-promoting features in these condensate-forming proteins. And what emerged then was a catalog and catalog identified more than 36,000 pathogenic mutations that are affecting condensate-promoting features in about 10%, 5% uh, uh, of the proteins encoded in our genome, and uh, that causing more than 1,750 different diseases segregated into about 1,200 Mendelian diseases and uh, over 550 cancers. And that, that catalog uh, recaptured proteins that have previously been implicated uh, through their mutation and condensate dysregulation. Uh, but they wanted to do some validation. And so what they did was to select uh, a number, I guess we're looking at about 12 instances here, where uh, they expressed in as a fusion with GFP, either a wild-type form of the protein or one of the pathogenic mutations in that protein and express them at about the same levels in murine embryonic stem cells, which is a platform for us to uh, explore these kinds of interactions. And what they found is that nearly 90% of the cases they tested indeed had Dis showed dysregulated condensate formation. And you'll see a few instances up here where we've actually obtained fewer uh, puncta in the nucleus of the cell uh, 
um, and it has it's been more widely distributed for um, this BARD1 protein that's been implicated in breast cancer and other phenotypes. Uh, for example, this one shown down here for BCL11A, where the loss of these puncta in the nucleus uh, has led to their accumulation uh, out in the cytoplasm. Well, what do these uh, uh, postulated dysregulated condensates cover? Well, they span the spectrum of human diseases. They span um, from both Mendelian and cancer um, a broad spectrum of cell and tissue types. And moreover, they involve most condensates that have been described so far in cells. There is a, uh, an enrichment, it's of interest to me, of condensates that uh, occur in the nucleus uh, amongst these um, uh, disease-associated mutations in condensate-forming proteins. So to summarize this part of the talk, um, uh, Salman, Lena, and Susanna have identified pathogenic mutations that plausibly contribute to condensate dysregulation in over 1,750 diseases. We think that condensate dysregulation is a pervasive pathological mechanism underlying a broad spectrum of disease, and what we hope the catalog does is to provide a resource for novel models of disease and therapeutic hypotheses. Now, I think this is actually an underestimate of the fraction of pathogenic mutations that lead to condensate dysregulation. It doesn't include, for example, mutations in uh, portions of proteins that have not necessarily been implicated in condensate formation, but that may regulate condensates or may incorporate themselves into condensates. And so I'm going to tell you a story of the latter case that was led by Alessandra D'Alignesi and, and Jesse Platt, and again, um, involves uh, my colleague, uh, Ibrahim Cisse, as well as uh, uh, Rudolf Ganesh, Linda Griffith, and uh, Jakob Jeppesen, who's the head of uh, Nova Nordis uh, Diabetes R&D. Diabetes is a very prevalent disease. As I, I mentioned, about 6% of the population currently has uh, type 2 diabetes. It's estimated that by 1945, um, that, will that will double, in essence. And that's an extraordinary load on budgets. It's actually contributing to some of what you see with uh, the, um, the fights we get in Congress over budgets because it's such an extraordinary load on our healthcare system. Core to this process of diabetes is what's called insulin resistance, and it's caused us to look carefully at insulin signaling, which is central to this metabolic control. You have some food, your pancreas senses that, it sends out punctate pulses of insulin, cells in the liver, the, the muscle, adipose tissue, the brain take this up, and it causes them, if they're performing correctly, to take up glucose and metabolize it. And the way uh, that works is through a receptor tyrosine kinase called the insulin receptor, which uh, at the plasma membrane of cells induces signaling through both the PI3K AKT pathway and the ERK pathway. The insulin receptor, like other RTKs, gets internalized and it's recycled. Uh, it also, uh, it now is now known, transports into the nucleus, although uh, until recently this is quite controversial. And so insulin resistance, which is the disease, is defined as a blunted response to insulin stimulation. Many different signaling pathways are known to employ condensates to promote signal transduction. We've heard this for the T cell receptor, for nuclear hormone signaling. My favorite 
is the postsynaptic density. That condensate, which is semi-membrane bound, allows us to have this conversation. And so without its function, uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Innate immune signaling, developmental signaling through the WINT, uh, beta catenin and uh, uh, SMAD and STAT pathways, these key pathways that actually allow complex organisms like us to develop from single fertilized cells. And as I mentioned, at least in one case, an RTK pathway, this for the uh, fibroblast growth receptor. And so how about the insulin receptor? Well, what uh, Alessandra and Jesse did was they collected tissue samples from human liver, uh, either healthy samples or samples from individuals with type 2 diabetes or samples from individuals with type 2 diabetes who are on the frontline drug metformin. And what they discovered is that the insulin receptor forms these punctate bodies in these cells. These, these are hepatocytes we're looking at within the liver, um, stained with CD, uh, CK18 antibodies. And what they found was that these puncta were considerably diminished in the patients with type 2 diabetes, but had recovered in these cells of patients that were taking metformin. And here's a zoom image of these puncta at the plasma membrane, the nucleus, and the cytoplasm, where you can see that at the same level of zoom, the livers from these type 2 diabetes patients have considerably less uh, signal, and that signal is recovered if those patients are on metformin. And this is quantitation across all those individuals. So what we think is happening is in this cartoon, the insulin receptor can, in the presence of ligand, uh, form a complex with insulin signaling proteins that uh, phase separates. Uh, this is where AKT and, and uh, ERK uh, begin their signaling process. Uh, as I said, the insulin receptor is recycled, and that can be done through vesicles. And we think there, and we, see, we have evidence that there are condensates associated with these vesicles. There are also um, insulin receptor condensates or puncta that look like they are not associated with membranes, but have escaped into the cytoplasm. And then there's insulin receptor at transcriptional condensates at insulin responsive genes. And I'm just showing you some pictures that would depict where uh, we think these, what, what we think are condensates. So let me show you a little bit of the data. And I'm showing you just a tiny fraction of the data this remarkable team collected. What we're looking at here now are hep G2 cells. And we selected hep G2 cells because it's a hepatocyte line that allows us to do genetic ma manipulation and explore various perturbations. So what we're doing here is we're taking these hep G2 cells, um, we're putting them in an environment where we begin with no insulin, we give them an acute stimulus of a physiological level of insulin, and we look at uh, the signal that's produced at the plasma membrane, the nucleus, and the cytoplasm. Uh, and what you can see here is that that acute stimulus causes an increase in the amount of uh, insulin receptor signal that we can see in the puncta. There's been no change in the total insulin receptor protein levels in the cell. This is happening in a, a short time frame. There's no change in the total level of protein. There's been a change in the amount of that protein that has found itself concentrated in these puncta. The puncta are biomolecular condensates. They are liquid-like. They contain at least dozens of insulin receptor molecules and other molecules that are involved in signaling and other functions. They form and dissolve in about uh, seven second average time frames. They fuse and they fission. And they contain their expected partners at the plasma membrane. They can 
contain uh, the key substrates that initiate signaling. In the cytoplasm, uh, those that are associated with uh, membranes are associated with this endosome marker, EA1. And in the nucleus, they're present at insulin responsive genes together with RNA polymerase II and mediator in transcriptional condensates. I just want to show you some direct evidence for this last statement because if you're reviewer number one, you really don't like this idea that this receptor tyrosine kinase gets into the nucleus. Well, CHIP-seq data says the insulin receptor gets there with mediator and with the large subunit of RNA polymerase II at every gene that we've examined. And if we don't use ChIP-seq, but rather use a mix of RNA fish and immune fluorescence, it looks like to us that at these insulin responsive genes, uh, the insulin receptor uh, co-occupies in a condensate uh, those loci. So about 10, I, I, about I would say three to 10,000 IR molecules enter the nucleus and they become associated with several hundred genes that are insulin responsive. QED, reviewer one. In, um, it's interesting though to ask then what happens in insulin resistance cells and you can induce insulin resistance as they've done down here by giving cells pathological levels of insulin for a period of days. And then they become non-responsive to an acute stimulus by insulin. And so I've shown you this data before up here. We'll take cells that are insulin responsive, add a, a physiological level of insulin for a short period of time, and you see this increase in the level of insulin receptor going into these condensates. Not so with the insulin resistant cells. What happens in those cases is it, you, you have about the same level of signal as a consequence of giving those resistant cells a, uh, an acute stimulus of physiological insulin. And there's no change in cellular IR levels. So this is a change in the ability of IR to incorporate itself into the condensates at these loci, at the plasma membrane, the, the cytoplasm, and the nucleus. Turns out, it, reviewer two, it's not an artifact of these being hep G2 cells. These, this same stuff happens in primary human hepatocytes and in primary human adipocytes. So it's not a, a feature of the cell line. And it's not specific to hyperinsulinemia. So I didn't tell you that it's well known that hyperinsulinemia can exacerbate and even cause insulin resistance. And that's the model that we're creating here. But, reviewer three, it, this isn't just hyperinsulinemia. Other models of insulin resistance, so you can get inflammatory stimuli that lead to insulin resistance, and you can get high glucose fat diets that produce insulin resistance. Same phenotype with respect to the insulin receptor. Well, metformin. Metformin's your front first line drug if you uh, have type two diabetes. And what does it do? Well, if you take metformin and treat um, the insulin resistant cells with that drug, now these are the hep G2 cells again, but works this way for primary human hepatocytes, for primary human adipocytes, then you can partially recover this ability of the insulin receptor to be responsive by incorporating more molecules into the condensates. That's pretty cool. So what's going on with these condensates? And uh, Ibrahim's given you two lectures now about uh, the power of TC Palm and we've employed that to ask about the average lifetime or the distribution of lifetimes of these insulin receptor containing condensates. And in insulin sensitive cells, as I mentioned to you, the average lifetime is about 
seven seconds. In the resistant cells, that lifetime increases. And we interpret that as the, uh, those condensates um, may have hardened or become a little, little bit more viscous, a little less mobile in terms of the molecules within. And remarkably, when you add metformin, it rescues that phenotype. So one of the things that happens when you take this meal uh, and then your pancreas produces insulin and you have these cells receiving it is that upon that insulin stimulus, one of the things that's happening is your mitochondria uh, upregulate their reactive oxygen species production. And you have natural systems to take out that reactive oxygen species proximal to the, um, the mitochondria. And the hypothesis that emerged knowing this is that elevated ROS would be a component of this pathological phenotype. And so what um, uh, Jesse and Alessandro were able to show is that in the insulin resistant cells, you have an elevated level of reactive oxygen species, that the treatment of these cells would reduce ROS in those insulin resistant cells, and that they could phenocopy then the effects of ROS by treating with a, uh, a level of hydrogen peroxide that the cells would see um, insulin sensitive cells and make them have an insulin resistant phenotype. So here's the evidence in insulin sensitive cells treated with hydrogen peroxide that you lose the ability when you stimulate the cells with insulin to see increased levels of the insulin receptor migrating into the puncta. So the model that emerges is, and I've shown you this part, that in insulin sensitive cells, you have these short lived condensates, form and dissolve. Some are large, some are small, but on average, they are about seven seconds in their lifetime. And we think there's more mo dynamic molecular exchange to account for that additional insulin receptor once liganded coming into these, these condensates. In the insulin resistant cells, due for some reason to the high ROS levels, uh, there are long, longer lived condensates and we infer there's less dynamic molecular exchange in those condensates. And so less ability for the insulin receptor to uh, find its way into those condensates. So in summary, we think these insulin receptor molecules, these receptor tyrosine kinases, reside in condensates in the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm, the nucleus of healthy cells when there is the, when the receipt of normal levels of insulin, it causes additional incorporation of IR molecules into these condensates. If the cells are insulin resistant, that incorporation is attenuated but you can rescue that with this metformin small molecule. And we think it's oxidative stress that's playing the dominant role in this phenotype in insulin resistant cells. And I just had one other thing, and that is that this is, this is among the many classes of stress that cells see. And it makes me wonder the extent to which um, this natural process of producing ROS and being exposed to ROS with time can contribute to dysfunctional condensates and many other diseases. So this is the spectrum of, uh, of diseases that I think, uh, or the minimal spectrum of diseases I think may involve condensate dysregulation. Is, is there good news in this space? And I'm gonna tell you something that we're very excited about, and that is work that's been done by Henry Kilgore, Peter Michael, uh, Kalen Overholt, uh, with um, a machine learning expert here named uh, Regina Barzilay. If you take 
all of the fluorescent, if you take all of the FDA approved drugs and uh, therapeutics that we use that aren't necessarily FDA approved, and you select the subset of those that are naturally fluorescent, and you ask what happens if you put them on cells and you monitor the behavior of the drug across the cells. What you find is much like you'll see here for say actinomycin D or Mlexinox, they do not distribute evenly through the cell. They end up concentrating in various bodies. Every drug does that. There isn't a single one we found that distributes evenly through the cell. And there's good news there in that um, if you take some drugs like camptothecin, this is a topoisomerase inhibitor and topoisomerase is in the nucleus, Camptothecin's concentrating in the nucleus. So it's likely on target at a higher concentration than if its target were in the cytoplasm. But there are other drugs, um, sunitinib I think is one, that are thought to be inhibiting receptor tyrosine kinases. But sunitinib's concentrating in mitochondria. The last time I checked, there were no receptor tyrosine kinases in mitochondria. So some drugs may have therapeutic benefit by going to the right place, concentrating by mechanisms that are independent of where their target lives, and others are finding their way into places where their target may not exist and where they may cause toxicity. This, by the way, is not a step, this kind of experiment, is not a step in any drug development process in the commercial world. Now, one of the things that's, that's quite fun to do, um, and, uh, uh, and, and we were taught by others to do this, is to consider the scaffold proteins for various condensates. That is, the proteins that appear to be playing dominant roles in the condensate by having multivalent interactions uh, Simone Alberti introduced me to this idea. And so what we were able to do is to take scaffold proteins for transcriptional condensates and splicing condensates and heterochromatin microphases and various components of the nucleolus and purify them and make uh, in vitro droplets. And we wanted to do that because then we could ask questions in uh, a purified system about the behaviors of various small molecules. And this is work that we published now a couple of years ago that was led by Isaac Klein and Ann Boja. And what they showed was that uh, fluorescein and other small molecule dyes would diffuse through those condensates. They would not enrich in them. They, they, wouldn't, uh, they weren't excluded from them. They freely diffused through. And so the enrichment ratio for all of these is, is one. Um, by contrast, there were some drugs that would concentrate selectively in a subset of these proteinate, these, these uh, homopolymer uh, condensates. And one that particularly interests us was cisplatin because this is the most widely used anti-cancer drug. It's used in one in five patients worldwide. And the reason it's, it's so widely used is because despite the fact that it's toxic, it is very efficacious. So what's it doing concentrating in these MED1 condensates? Um, and it turns out, um, because of fluorescence quenching and other phenomena, the, uh, this enrichment ratio I'm showing here of about 15 is not reflective of the extent to which it concentrates there. And work we did with Tony Hyman and his collaborators, we found that it was actually enriching about 600 fold uh, inside the condensate versus outside. So we did an experiment uh, in cells where we asked if we treated tumor cells with cisplatin, where did it go? What, what, where in the DNA did it platinate? And the textbook tells you it, it randomly platinates DNA, creates a, a challenge to tumor cells because they're rapidly replicating their DNA, 
uh, those addicts cause the cells to need to repair the DNA, and uh, that, that's a special challenge. But what we instead found that when we use an antibody against platinated DNA, so it's not recognizing cisplatin, it's recognizing the, the platinated DNA, that it was highly enriched in super enhancers. And that interested us tremendously because what we know about super enhancers is that these involve, say, uh, 10 KB or so of DNA highly populated by transcription factors and coactivators, as Ibrahim has told you. And they form these, these, these condensates that have various lifetimes. Uh, so they, uh, they appear and they disappear. In tumor cells, the oncogene drivers don't have super enhancers like this. They have super enhancers that occupy at least an order of magnitude more DNA. In some cases, for example, in the MYC locus, the, super, the driver super enhancers of MYC, which is the metastatic oncogene for those cells, can be as much as half a megabase of DNA, 500,000 Daltons just spread with enhancer material. These condensates, much larger, much longer lived. And so what we think is happening is uh, because they're, they're they're essentially stable condensates. They accumulate far more cisplatin than the smaller, more short-lived condensates in normal cells. And they are destroying the oncogene. So the hypothesis that emerges, the model that emerges from this concept is that the reason cisplatin is so effective is because it's not randomly damaging your DNA, creating a challenge for DNA damage repair. It's destroying the driver oncogene, which is different in each tumor cell. I think that's a fascinating hypothesis. And it's led us to consider if we could gain more insight into the behaviors of small molecules uh, in, uh, with respect to condensates. And Julie Foreman, uh, Kay, and others have proposed that condensates may harbor a unique fluid solvent environment that's created from the ensemble of molecules and is different than the chemical environment that's local to a particular portion of a protein. And there's evidence for this in that you can see selective partitioning of biomolecules. I've shown you some selective partitioning of small molecules. But this has never really been, to my knowledge, investigated in any detail. And we wondered if we can develop some chemical rules, kind of a chemical grammar for various condensates. I think it'd be quite powerful if we learned that condensates formed by different components to do different jobs actually had a different internal chemistry that differentially solvated proteins, RNAs, small molecules. So what they did was they'd use this uh, droplet assay that I described before. And uh, we, we developed uh, with Young Tae Chang a fluorescent probe library uh, based on a Bodipi core that had R groups that allowed us to assemble a library of about 6,000 compounds, all fluorescent, all with the same core. And that allowed us to ask whether or not the behavior of these small molecules um, was different from one simple in vitro condensate to another. And, and they are. So this is a, a graph that shows you for the partitioning ratio K for MED1, for HP1 alpha, and for NPM1 droplets in vitro. And I've just selected the most selective small molecule to show you over here on the right uh, that uh, gave us the strongest evidence for differential partitioning. So if there really is a different chemistry that differentially solvates these different molecules, then one prediction is that the small molecules that tend to go into one condensate will tend to share chemical features. 
And the way one way chemists can approach that problem is they can do what's called a Morgan fingerprint and create a bit vector that takes into account each atomic interaction with its neighbor. And they can take these Morgan fingerprint bit vectors and use a process called Tanimoto similarity to map out for every pair of probes what their similarity is. And that process led us to conclude that the kinds of chemistries in this 6,000 compound library that prefer to go into one condensate are similar and more similar than the kinds of chemistries that like to go into another condensate. So this suggests to us that these different simple condensates in vitro have different internal chemical environments. Now if they do, and you had enough data, you should be able to use a deep learning process to identify the features that uh, are common in those molecules. And so we got, this is where we got together with uh, uh, Peter Mikkel and Regina Barzilay and used a, a deep learning model that has been used before. This, this is not one that needed to be invented. It's been used before to explore uh, small molecule space. And then we trained it on a subset of that data for each of the three different condensates, those formed by MED1, NPM1, and HP1. And remarkably, that deep learning model was nearly 100% accurate in predicting which of the untested small molecules would partition favorably into each of the three different in vitro condensates. So embedded in the vector that describes each small molecule is the chemical grammar that creates those predictions that gives that near 100% accuracy. So a deep learning approach can in fact infer, can take, if you are in industry and you're doing a, a drug screen and you start out with a two million compound library, you, you you're not gonna be able as a chemist to inspect each of two million compounds, but and by the end of the day, predict which of those should work in your assay. But now we believe if you take a tiny subset of that library and explore these condensates, you'll be able to predict accurately which of all the rest of the compounds should go into that assay, if, that, if this is your, if this assay is of interest. But the key question to me is, can these simple in vitro condensates uh, tell us anything about the chemical environment in a living cell, in a dynamic environment where the condensate has many other components? And when Simone Alberti told me about how a biochemist would use a scaffold protein, make, uh, reconstitute a condensate in vitro, I always thought that was, you know, I've done biochemistry before. I always thought that was going to be too simplified a model. And yet, I had seen now multiple times where in studying transcriptional components, the behaviors of proteins in terms of those different condensates in vitro would translate into the living cell. So I thought we just repeatedly got lucky. But in fact, it turns out that the machine learning trained on the in vitro condensates is astonishingly predictive of the ability of small molecules to partition into the condensate where that scaffold exists. Now, it's far from perfect. The accuracy, for example, uh, when we um, make predictions of how frequently a molecule, so here, here's a cancer drug, mitoxantrone. It, it ended up as a true positive uh, in the scoring by this machine learning algorithm trained on the in vitro condensates. Um, we also had 
uh, of course, true negatives. So we were testing this for, in this case, uh, Donna Rubison. So these were not as perfect a prediction as they were in the in vitro condensates, but I'm amazed they worked at all. And in fact, the, here are the accuracy and diagnostic odds ratio for uh, the predictions for nuclear incorporation. These are nucleoli, for example, that mitosantrons in. Now you see mitosantrons out in the cytoplasm as well. We're not trying to make the argument that um, this is the only place the drug would go. We were just interested in whether or not some of the drug would go to the complex condensate uh, in the living cell uh, that had the scaffold protein. And uh, so it works, to my great surprise. This, to me, suggests that um, within the more complex milieu of the cell, the chemistry formed by the scaffold protein is one that is liked by the chemistry of other proteins around it. In solvation, like solvates like. So there may be other, the other molecules that like to be there may share the chemistry induced by that uh, scaffold protein. Alternatively, there may be small little micro droplets that are formed by uh, those proteins at, that confer within a subset of that in vivo condensate, that chemistry. And that's what we're seeing. I don't know. But I'm astonished that this works as well as it does. So I think we can, con we can conclude that condensates create distinct chemical solvation environments that can selectively concentrate small molecules. So just think of all the metabolic molecules that cells are dealing with. Deep learning can ascertain the chemical features of small molecules that enable it to predict where they're going to concentrate, at least in vitro. Those in vitro models that are recapitulating aspects of in vivo condensates can be predictive of chemical partitioning at both levels of complexity. And I think this has important implications for two things, our understanding of the molecular interactions within cells, just that basic science, and for improving the pharmacological activity of therapeutics. You can build a small molecule that has super high affinity against your target, but if that small molecule doesn't like to go into the condensate where your target lives, then it's gonna have a, low, a lower therapeutic index than you would like. So I'd just like to end by uh, thanking this remarkable team uh, for allowing me to present their story to you, um, acknowledge really just a fun set of collaborators. These, these people have just made my life a real pleasure over the last five years or so that we've been collaborating. Uh, thank you, NIH and NSF, for your support. And uh, if you want to join us, please do so. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. First question. In the insulin part, the time scale goes up from 7 to 15. But for that to matter, there must be another time scale for which this change matters. What, what are these other time scales for which a change from 7 to 15 makes a difference? Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting question, Rup. And one of the, so, you know, this is where uh, my limitation is, I really only understand transcription. So if I go to transcription and I think about um, the dynamics of transcriptional condensates, and as Ibrahim has taught us, there's, there are, for many genes, this very rapid formation, a burst, and then a shutdown of that condensate. If I reduce that dynamic by that small factor, I'm going to have an impact, I think, on the output of that gene. If that's my 100 insulin responsive genes, then I'm creating a, a challenge for that cell. 
And as you know, diabetes doesn't kill us immediately, right? It's a chronic, persistent problem for years. It creates damage in multiple organ systems. So that, that's my suggestion. Other questions? Uh, so if you do RNA-seq on the cisplatin-treated cells, do you see effects for the genes that are affected by the super enhancers where you can chip cisplatinated DNA? Um, what we see in cisplatin-treated tumor cells is such a catastrophic change in those cells that I'm not really sure what to trust about it. But if, but if we use another transcriptional drug, JQ1, which affects BRD4, Jay Bradner and I uh, first did this experiment in multiple myeloma cells and found to our shock that despite the fact that BRD4 is at every active promoter, it's really the mix super enhancer that is among the most dominantly affected. And we were never able to understand why, you know, what is it, was there some kind of special cooperativity at that enhancer that caused it to be especially affected? Well, it turns out JQ1 concentrates in these MED1 BRD4 ah, condensates. Okay. And so now we think it's just like cisplatin. Right. And so we did do the RNA-seq experiment there, and, 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 it, and the effect was very selective, remarkably selective. I guess it's complicated also because you're going to induce DNA damage, and so there's a DNA damage response, you know, apoptotic response and whatever if you... Way well, longer. also, that, that's correct. It, if you acutely lose MEC and many of the other transcriptional drivers, then the cell immediately begins to undergo apoptosis, and then you're measuring kind of chaos. I had a, another question about the HP1 compounds, or compounds that target HP1 condensates. Do you see any phenotypic effect or change in heterochromatin due to or altered condensate behavior by compounds to go into the HP1 condensates? Yeah, that's a very good question. And if my chemist were here, I could ask him that question and get an answer. I don't know. What we see, I would just say more generally, one of the phenotypes we see when drugs do concentrate in a condensate is, they, is with time, they will create an alteration, as you might expect. So most of the experiments we're doing, uh, we're capturing images in very short time frames, like just a minute after it sees that drug. But that could be super interesting if you had genes that were heterochromatic shut off in some cell types, and you could induce that to by altering the HP1 condensate. And I think this is in, the, in a class of ideas where it would modulate the condensate rather than just a specific protein target or specific RNA target, you might have an effect, a desirable effect. Yeah, I, um, I have a question about the, um, the deep gen uh, model that you, uh, deep learning model that you used. I may have missed this. So what are you feeding into the, into the model? Is it uh, like bimolecular reaction rates? Uh, and uh, also, are there physical properties of the small molecules also uh, being fed to the model that it can um, like predict more accurately, or what's the input? Well, if you, if you just think about sort of basic chemistry, the solvation properties of water to octanol, we are just thinking about this in terms of where you are on that scale of chemical solvation. And so each small molecule will find its place there right. in that space. And the condensates are producing internally some kind of solvation potential in that range. Mm -hmm. And so since like solvates like, you'll get those small molecules that have that solvation potential of the, that are similar to that of the condensate itself. So th I see, so there is a scalar number for a s small molecule. Pardon me? So there is like a scalar, oh, it's, the it's the vector for all the different molecules. Yeah. That's I see. 
I see. And what is then is just the big vector and the solid yeah. data, which you collect. I see, I see. Yeah. Okay, okay. So there are no physical no, properties sorry. like viscosity and all, which might also be... Not in these know, assays. Okay. Those would be interesting assays to do. Dave there? Sorry, sir. That's okay. <laughs> Here you go. In your in vitro condensate experiments, when you deliver a small molecule, let's say metformin, um, what fraction of, of, of the molecules that you deliver in terms of concentration, say, get incorporated? What fraction of the small molecules are incorporated into the condensate? Yep. The reason I ask that question is, eventually you want this ther therapy to work in vivo, and hopefully it's a very large fraction, and the ones that don't get incorporated, presumably the cell has some clearing mechanism to get rid of it. Otherwise, you, I, you know, there could be some toxic effects, possibly. I don't know. I mean, so. No, I, you're, you're absolutely right. And there's, you report to the FDA um, the adsorption, uh, but close, the, the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics measured by, for example, different tissue distributions. And so that's generally measured in humans. You want, as you, much as you can, you want to know the tissue distribution of a drug. It's not a trivial thing to do. But no one tests tissue, uh, cellular distribution of drug. And yet the target's in the cell, typically. So I think um, to try and directly answer your first question, um, and I'm guessing at the moment, uh, between 1% and 10% of the drug we put into a test tube finds its way into the condensates that may represent a volume there that is only a percent of the total volume. So there's plenty of drug outside the condensate. It's not that it all goes in. It's just an enrichment relative to the outside environment. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I, I have one. So in your nice screen of the small molecules, right, you can, uh, in, you can also learn actually about the internal environments of the specific condensates, right, by the class or the types of molecules that tend to, that have affinity for specific ones. So I was wondering if you have observed or noticed like any types of correlation that, for example, what are the types of molecules that nucleoli, that are preferred by nucleoli or speckles or HP1 and so on, right? Because you will see that some will be polar, some will be so-and-so, charged, uncharged. Yeah. yeah that's that's exactly right. And so we've, we've done that only for a trivial number of condensates. But this is the sort of Regina Barzelay and my next project to, to characterize the chemical environment of various cellular condensates with respect to their preferences for concentrating small molecules that were only limited by the fact that if, if we mark some of the smaller condensates with, say, a fluorophore, that's so much more brilliant than the fluorescence of the small molecules. So we have to, that's our technological problem. If those of you have ideas for solving that, you let us know. We've used two photon approaches. Uh, that's been a little helpful. But mass action and many other issues uh, create a real problem with us doing that in a systematic way. Mm -hmm. We'd love to get input on that. Dipti has a question. Hi, um, great talk. Uh, I was just wondering if you could comment on um, the f concentrations used in these in vitro droplet assays and how they might compare to physiological concentrations, and also what you think um, about the effect of multi-component mixtures, because presumably in the droplet assays, you're looking at like one protein at a time, scaffold proteins, as you said. So how might that affect um, the partition ratio in vivo versus in vitro? Yeah. So both for the protein 
the, at least the concentration of the protein in the condensate in vitro, we think that's within about a log of its concentration in condensates in the cell. And this may actually contribute to why there is some predictive capability that that concentration is not too far off. Um, with respect to the small molecule, um, it's nearly impossible to know what the exposure of a cell is to a small molecule in a living human being. Um, but in those cases where you can estimate it, for example, it was, it's been estimated for metformin, so we could use physiological levels. So I think um, we selected the same concentration for all those drugs, and I think it was around 10 micromolar in those experiments. That's not too far off of what we expect. For those drugs where there's some knowledge, that's not too far off of what we expect for uh, exposure within a tissue. But I would, there are a lot of caveats to that comment. Wonderful, let's thank Rick again.